know we had uh, this weekend the first retreat we've had in a little over a year. I know that uh, September is when I got the COVID the second time. And uh, so I don't remember exactly when we had to shut things down here, but we, we followed the, the guidelines of our glorious governor and didn't have anybody in. And uh, then we were able to have services out on the patio, so we moved things out there and did that. And then we were told we could have 25% of the people we had, blah, 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 and so much space between them, and so we did that. And all the time that was going on, we basically closed the meditation hall because I felt that it was uh, people were too close to each other in there. Uh, you know, you're sitting side by side with people, and it was just simpler that way. And I felt if, if there was a, a need, then we could do our meditation, we could do our retreat in this room and get some space. In, a, in the meditation tradition, there is, there is the tradition of uh, the Kung An, which is the Chinese, and in, in Japan it's called Koan, and uh, in Korean it's called something like a Wawu. I don't have Wanji here to tell me the proper way to say that. And uh, it's a system of trying to get people to let go of their preconceived ideas about what reality is, which most of the time has very little to do with reality anyway, but it has a lot to do with what they think they see or what they think they hear, uh, what they think is going on. <coughs> and. Uh, my political statement is, if you were to ask somebody what's going on in politics in America today, I doubt that anybody could give you a good answer. I, I really do. Uh, they, they might get angry. They might avoid the question. They might offend you. But uh, to really understand what's going on, I, I don't know. Well. Our reality is exactly that. It's what we see and what we experience. And, and uh, it doesn't mean it's what reality is. It simply means that's the reality. Uh, and in the practice of Zen, we had, uh, catch my breath, we had uh, these situations that uh, where the teacher would pose a question to the student. And the question wasn't a trick question. It was, it, it could be as simple as, uh, what, do you, what do you think's going on in the kitchen? Or what happened last night when the bell rang? Something like that. Won't make a lot of sense, but in the beginning, and this all started in China, in the beginning, the master would come get everybody together probably about once a week and they'd all come into a big room like this and he would give a talk and sometimes he'd just simply give a talk that was the job that went to the abbot um, we know that in China in the last hundred years in the monasteries he had to give a talk every day and a lot of talking and uh, he would do it in the morning. You know, two people got up before everybody and went to bed after everybody. It was, it was the abbot and it was the head cook. They had to get up before everybody and they had, they had to clean up and they went to bed after everybody else had. And he would go down to the meditation hall. Uh, we're talking China, back when they were, we had Buddhism in China. And uh, they would give a talk in the first round of meditation during the day. And most of the time they were not confronting the monks, but when they all came together with a master in a room and, 
And they still, in Japan, they still have monasteries that have this special room where you just go in and the master talks to you. Well, we've got a lot of rooms here. And when we built our second room and our third room, I thought, I think I understand why they had a lot of rooms now. Because uh, most places in America, they have a room. When, uh, and it's, it's, it's very telling, when the Vietnamese came here, they had a room. The monk would move into a house, the living room would become where the Buddha statue went, and that was the, uh, the temple room. And if the Japanese came here, they would rent a house, and the living room would become the zendo, the meditation room. And uh, we were doing something here. We had a lot of monks at the time. And some of them came up here to get some training in how to do something. And the rest of them were down in the meditation room. And they were meditating. And there were a couple of them that were over in the, the original house, which is where we eat our meals. And they were preparing lunch. And I thought, now I get why there's all these rooms. Because one of the problems we had in the early days was, well, if, we're, if we've got this room, we're calling this a meditation room, then don't go in there and start banging pots and pans around to make lunch because it's really distracting for Larry. You know, he, he can't deal with this, all this extra noise. So, but then we get together and the master would give him a talk. Sometimes the master came out and, and uh, it was, it was back when Zen started being Zen, or Chan. And he might come out, and he always had a special seat. I have a special seat here. You're all welcome to come look at it after we're done if you want. <laughs> you can touch it. Uh, for years, I couldn't understand why uh, Tibetan monks, and then later, you know, sat up on these thrones. I think of them as a throne. They called it a throne. So the monk would go up there like he was royalty and he'd sometimes have a little ladder to climb up and he'd <laughs> sit down on this thing and he'd have two or three cushions in there. It was really a special. And then Yat Han got himself a place and the next thing I know I was, I was looking at some pictures and there he was, he was on, a, on one of these thrones. And I thought, well, what the heck's with him? Now he should know better than that. You know, he shouldn't be imitating royalty getting up on that throne. And about the time I thought that, I realized that it was just a thought. And I looked at the picture again and I realized that everybody in that room, which was quite large, could see him. And that's why he was up on that stand. And that told me why the Tibetan monks were up on their stand. Everybody in the room can see them. And probably hear them a little bit better because it didn't get filtered through all of these bodies in the room. So I, I got some wood and I made me a stand. Because I used to sit on the floor down here and give the talk. Now, to start with, monks aren't supposed to do that. They're not supposed to be sitting on the same level as the lay people. But I'm an American and Americans don't like rules, so <laughs> I'm going to sit on the floor and give a talk to the lay people until I realized there was a reason to sit up here. Uh, and in Japan they have this, interestingly enough, it's a chair. But it's this big oversized chair that the monks get, and they can sit in lotus position, you know, they can all of that, and they have it in the zendo, and the abbot comes in and sits down in this chair. They have it in a lecture hall, the abbot sits, sits in his chair. And sometimes the abbot comes out and he does something like this. And leaves. And everybody goes, oh, he's really enlightened. <laughs> what? He is something special. Did you see what he did? And everybody goes, yeah. And he held it up and showed it to everybody and then he, he left. Wow. 
boy, did I learn a lesson today. And they, you know, they go outside back in the days when people smoked. The Japanese were the, probably the worst people in the entire world. I knew a number of Japanese people, and they were like little choo-choo trains. Uh, and they, the monks would go outside to get their smoke, you know. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> and then they'd go on. Did you understand what that meant? Well, no. Did you understand what that meant? No. So then one day they got enough nerve to ask him. And they said, uh, Master, last week you came out and were going to give us our talk. And of course all the monks had beads of different sizes. These are, I got these big ones here so you can see them, you know, in case you have, have a little problem that way, Larry. <laughs> Make sure you can see these beads. I love you too, bro. I love you too. <laughs> Larry came and sat with me for an hour and a half in the hospital. He's a pretty good guy in my book. That's right. <laughs> And so they, they held up their beads and they said, Master, I don't understand this. And the Master said, the plum tree in the yard. Now that's a Vietnamese Master giving that answer. Classic problem. I have now given you a problem to solve. Uh, you ask what this meant. And I said, the plum tree in the garden. In China, the same koan was given, and koan, by the way, literally means public case, because in the beginning, the master would pose these questions to all the monks, and everybody would hear it. And then some monk that was feeling pretty, pretty smart, he'd jump up and say, you know, his answer. Or maybe he might just make a loud noise. Or maybe he just might turn and walk out. And so, the monk asked, what does that mean? And he said, the plum tree in the garden. So, as human beings, we get confused all the time. We, we think that our version of the world is everybody's version of the world, and if it's not everybody's version of the world, by golly, it should be. <laughs> yeah, everybody should see things the way we see them. And uh, maybe that's part of the reason why we can't stop going to war. Because we keep thinking that other people ought to think just exactly like we think. Now, I've never been to Europe. I've been to the Orient. But I've never been to Europe. But I can tell you in the Orient, people don't think like we think. I, I guarantee you, I've been to Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, and they do not think like us. And I'm just talking as if we we're a big blanket of people. They, they have different values. And they're not wrong. And I'm not right. This is culture. And culture simply grows up from your living conditions and where you live and what you've gone through. But we don't recognize that. We get upset with people because they don't think like us. Well, a plum tree doesn't get confused. And that's what the master meant. When he held up this, Give this an attribute. Talks too much? I don't think so. Hmm. Thinks too much about things? No, I don't think so. Makes bad decisions? No. Matter of fact, this set of beads here does a good job of just being a set of beads. <laughs> now a plum tree, in a good year, it has lots of plums. And of course those are babies. It has lots of babies. And in a bad year, it doesn't have so many. We have a couple of plum trees. And boy, usually we have bumper crops with them. And, uh, but I've, I've never heard a plum tree, and I've stood out there and looked at these plum, had to prune them a little bit, Monica over here. She wasn't up here this year, but in the past, she, she's an authority. She really is, <laughs> has a degree in it. She comes up and, and does some pruning on our fruit trees so they'll be more bountiful. Plum tree never said anything to me. I went out there with my little pruners and I said, okay, tell me what you want me to do. Plum tree didn't say anything. <laughs> plum tree is doing a great job of being a plum tree. <laughs> you know, and about the only thing that, plum tree only has a few things it does. One, it gives us something pretty to look at. 
He gives us some good fruit to eat. Sometimes it's canned. <coughs> Sometimes it disappoints us because it doesn't have a lot of fruit. And if we're not careful, if we're not good husbands, and we don't go water that tree, and by the way, a little English lesson here for that's where husband comes from. You're supposed to water your wife. Because a husband was originally a term used with a farmer. And if we don't take care of that tree, that tree dies on us. That tree didn't do it on purpose. We neglected it. But most of the time that tree just sits there and does the most stellar job of being a tree. And you hear about old crazy Zen masters, they go out into the woods and the next thing you know they're standing there talking to a tree. How you doing? Well, you look like you're doing okay. And you know what the funny thing is, not necessarily funny, trees talk to trees, did you know that? Yes, Anybody belong to the National Geographic Society or go by the magazine, the newsstand? No, no, no. They have discovered that some trees talk to other trees. And they, their, their thing that makes it happen is a mold. There's a mold under the ground that we never see and they can talk to each other. Trees walk. Did you know that? Did you know that trees walk? One of the misconceptions that we have, and uh, I was so glad to read about this, is that one of the misconceptions is when we uh, landed on these shores and ran, ran off the Native Americans, had to get them out of the way to start with, and then we started farming. And the first thing we did was we cut down trees. Because you can't, can't take your mule and your plow out there and, and do much of anything if you got a bunch of trees, right? So we had to clear the land. And for years, scientists thought that the lack of certain kinds of trees up in New England and in the Midwest came about because we cleared the land. And then they discovered, no, trees walk. Because when they, the real scientists got in there, they found out that, okay, we'll do this kind of tree up in New England. And then later on, it was in the Midwest. And later on, it came to the West Coast. And now it's moved into Canada. And how is it doing that? How is that tree walking? The wind, the birds, the animals. They're all there. You learned about them in school, but you, you never made the connection. We haven't lost those trees. They just move from one end of the country to the other end of the country. That's, that's a big relief. Because when I first read about decimating trees, and I, I like books about what we were doing 200 years ago. I'm fascinated by those things. The tools they had, the things they made, you know, and all of that stuff. And I start realizing, well, wait a minute. Yeah, this, this was going on. But we didn't, we didn't intuit that. We didn't know that. We didn't look around and say, oh, well, forests move. But it takes place. Oak trees are oak trees. They never get confused. Human beings get confused all the time. Do you know that I, can, I could probably start naming names here for half an hour of people that think they're more important than you? Nobody's more important than anybody. There was a thing when I was going to school years ago in psychology class, and the psychology teacher was a psychiatrist, you know, they boy, they know what's going on. And he came up with, uh, and you've heard this problem before, if there were 10 people in a boat and the boat was going to sink and we had to get rid of half of them, who would we get rid of? Or that's one way they tell the story. Where they say we got five people and and uh, there's only enough food for four people and you know you know that if you try to divide that food amongst the five people somebody's going to die or maybe a lot of them and then they tell you who's who's there well a carpenter's there a musician's there a mother's there a doctor that they always have a doctor because now, who would you sacrifice? 
who is more important? That's the question. Who is more important? Nobody is more important. No, it's an illusion. You think the doctor is more important, but, you know, if you really analyze it, it probably isn't because he hasn't got a hospital. He hasn't got an office. He hasn't got his bag with him. He hasn't got any medicine. All he can do is he's got a cold. Well, the mom can do that. <laughs> she knows what a cold looks like, right? And it's, it's a real conundrum. I'll tell you what good human beings do. They do their level best to save everybody. And most of the time it works. Most of the time. But we have to stop thinking that we need to be more important. We're very important. Everybody in this room is very important. We're part of a living organism called humanity. But one person's not more important. Our governor's no more important than we are. And we're no more important than the guy that picks up our trash every week. If we didn't have him, we'd have a real problem. Think about it. Just, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go over to Barstow to the dump. And go over there and just stand there for a while where people are pulling their garbage off of their trucks and think, well, I'm glad that's not my front yard. <laughs> okay, so these guys that pick up the trash, they're important. You stop and you get a sandwich. I hope you realize that everybody in that place is important. And you know, it's more than you think. It's not just a guy cooking the sandwich. If nobody went to that place, there would be nobody cooking the sandwich. If they didn't have any customers, you would have no place to go. Everybody's really important. Larry, once in a while over here, my friend Larry, mm -hmm. uh, he, we go out for a hot dog. And he's very concerned. He's married to a lady that's a little older than him. He's very concerned about taking the COVID home. And I understand that. And, uh, but he came up with, he takes her out, and they, they, they go to a place where you can buy the food and sit in the car and eat it. And she doesn't get exposed. She's a healthy woman, but she's a little bit older than him. And he's really concerned. We didn't see him for a long time. He's really concerned about taking sickness home, as he should be. But we go and he takes me to this place, and I got a hot dog. It's like that long. <laughs> and I had two meals off of that because he, he bought me that. And I like their slushy, but uh, Larry's very important, but he's no more important than anybody else. If we ever get our tractor fixed, then it will be fixed one of these days. Larry's going to come and fix our roads. He used to do that, and I'd go out in the parking lot, and I'd go, boy, that looks good. What happened there? I don't understand. How did, the, how did it get so nice? It was Larry. He didn't say anything to any of us. He just came over here with his little little room room and, and his drag and clean up the parking lot. Everybody's just as important. And when you start to think you're more important, you need to do something. It might be meditation. It might be go for a run. It might go be go talk to a tree. Because imagine a world without any trees. Mm. You don't think a tree is important? Ooh. Everything's important. And because I say that, it's really important that you take care of each other. If you believe what I'm saying. 